So now let's see how we can use complex numbers to analyze uh, time-dependent circuits. When we analyze time-dependent circuits in earlier videos, we used a form like this where we'd say that some voltage is a function of time is equal to say two and a half volts, which we called our amplitude, times the cosine of omega t, where omega is the frequency, in this case in radians per second. Now we're going to use the fact that e to the j omega t is equivalent to sines and cosines and write our voltage in a form where we have some complex amplitude that we'll write as x plus j y times e to the j omega t. Now this is going to seem a little bit weird because we're talking about a thing that you might think is physical like a voltage and we're going to represent it with something that we call complex or imaginary. So we've got this weird kind of imaginary signal. So in this video, I hope to show you that it's actually okay to do this, and it's actually very, very convenient to do it. You just kind of have to get over the hurdle that we're going to represent a voltage with these kind of imaginary numbers. And so again, just because we call them imaginary numbers does not mean they're made up. So now let's remember our complex uh, number out here. We could also use the relationships that uh, the magnitude of the complex number, the distance to the origin, is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, and that the angle with the real axis is nothing more than the arc tangent of the imaginary part over the real part. And using these relationships, we saw in some of the previous videos that we could write this number here as r e to the j theta times r e to the j omega t. So again, since I have exponential times exponential, I can simply rewrite that. And if I want to put this back into sine and cosine form, I can do that using my relationship that e to the j number is equal to cosine of number plus j sine of number. And so now we're seeing that if we represent a signal, a voltage which is changing with time as a complex number times e to the j omega t, that somehow this complex number here is embedding with it both the amplitude and the phase in the signal, right? Because now we have a form that looks like what we had before where R, the amplitude of our complex number is the magnitude of the signal in volts. And the angle or how much real part, and how much imaginary part is giving us some sense of an angle or a phase that we, we talked about before when we an analyze these uh, types of time dependent circuits. So I hope you see that this is uh, equivalent, this complex notation is somehow embedding the amplitude of the signal and the phase in it, but we've got this kind of strange thing in that we're saying a voltage has a real part and an imaginary part. And again, you just have to get over the hurdle of the names. This part is no more real than this part of the signal. So let's work out an example in kind of gory detail, and hopefully all this will become clear, and you'll believe me that this is a cool thing to do. And I'll show you that it's actually a very, very easy thing to do which gets us out of the habit of having to know all of our trig identities and makes analyzing circuits quite simple. Okay, so now let's work a simple example. I'm gonna have a simple resistor and capacitor in series. So this is an example that we've worked before. So the current I, so now you see why we use J for the complex number, is given by Ohm's law, Vn minus V out over R. That current, which has to be the same, because what goes through the resistor must go through the capacitor is also equal to C times dV out dt. So if I combine these two equations by just equating the currents, we're left with the equation that we uh, derived previously in a previous video. Now in the previous video, we assumed that Vn and V out were sines and cosines, or we specifically assumed that Vn was given by some amplitude times sine of omega t, and V out was given by some new amplitude times sine of omega t plus some phase. Now we're gonna assume complex numbers. So let's assume that my input voltage is one volt times e to the j omega t, which is equivalent to cosine of omega t plus j sine of omega t. And let's assume that v out is given by some number, capital V, v naught, which is my complex number, e to the j omega t. So again, we saw that this number can, can represent both the magnitude and the phase of my signal. So this will be equivalent to the magnitude of this complex number V naught. So this is just using the relationship that we derived on the previous page that now represented in our complex number is the amplitude and the phase of our signal. So the only thing weird here is that we have both this real thing and this imaginary thing, and that might bother you, but let's just work it out and kind of see what it gives us. So let's take these two forms, 
for v in and v out and stuff it into this equation and kind of see what we get. So let me just take the derivative of what we had for, for v naught. So that is the derivative d by dt of v out. So just our assumed form. So the cosine turned to sine, the sine terms to cosine. We picked up a factor of omega. And now let me just put in our assumed forms for v in and v out, again using our sine and cosine notation. And I'm keeping my real terms as blue and my imaginary terms as red. So that's v in. Now we have to do minus v out. And it just went off the screen, so let me just slide over there. So there's our equation. So there's our derivative, there's v in, there's v out. And in order for this equation to be satisfied and everything to be happy, both the real and the imaginary part of the equations have to both be zero. So let's sort of group things together then by blue and red. So now we have both a blue equation and a red equation. So the real part is the blue. The imaginary part is what gave us the red. Now we actually solved this equation once already. And if we go back to the video on when we uh, use sines and cosines to analyze these types of circuits, we solved the, the red problem. And we solved the red problem only because we assumed our input signal was a sign. And when we solved the red problem, the answer that we got was that the angle, the tangent of theta, was equal to minus RC omega. And our solution for the uh, magnitude of my complex number, V naught, turned out to be 1 over cosine theta. And that was kind of the weird form we derived it in. And then we used our trig identities to make this uh, just in terms of RC and omega. So we solved that red problem. Uh, doing a whole bunch of trig identities. Now it might not be surprising to you that the solution to the blue problem should actually be the same because what was stopping us from assuming that the input was a cosine and rather than a sine? Because what's the difference? It's only just a shift of 90 degrees. So the answer that we get for a sine should be the same one we get for a cosine. But we can actually prove that that's true. So let's actually work through the cosine solution just to absolutely convince you uh, that the cosine solution is the same as the sine solution or the real solution is the same as the imaginary solution. So this is the blue problem that we wanted to solve. So let's just expand these terms out using our trig identities just like we did before. So if I expand all those things out, So let me group the sine of omega t terms because remember when we did this kind of analysis before, we said in order for this equation to be true, all the terms that multiply sine omega t must be zero and all the terms that multiply cosine omega t must also separately be zero uh, because we want this equation to be true at every instance in time. So if I group the sine of omega t terms, I get the same answer that I got before, that the tangent of theta is equal to minus RC omega. Now let me group the cosine of omega t terms together. I made a little mistake there, but I think I got it right now. So if I group the cosine of omega t terms together, again, those will all cancel out. And if I regroup it, I can solve for v naught, which gives me 1 over cosine of theta minus rc omega sine of theta, which again is the same thing as the red problem that we got before. So this is really cool, right? Because now I've hopefully shown that the solution for sine of omega t is absolutely the same as for cosine of omega t, something that you probably could have guessed already. So putting in a signal, assuming that Vn has a form e to the j omega t is equivalent to assuming it's cosine plus imaginary number times the sine of omega t. And this works because uh, it, we get the right answer whether we put in cosine or sine. And so we can just put in e to the j omega t. And both if the real part is 0, the imaginary part will be 0. So we don't have to worry about the fact that we have a voltage which has a real and imaginary part. We're just using this kind of notation for simplicity that we just analyzed using these complex numbers rather than expanding things out in sines and cosines and kind of see what we get. So recall that for our circuit of interest, uh, 
that was our equation. So we're going to assume that Vn is 1 volt times e to the j omega t, and that V out is some complex number, V naught, times e to the j omega t. Now let's just plug these things in. So I can take the derivative of dV out dt quite easily. So now I've just substituted everything in using my e to the j omega t notation. My e to the j omega t's just simply cancel out. And I can rearrange it for my complex number, which sits out here as equally 1 plus rc j omega, which was a heck of a lot easier because I didn't need to know or remember a single trig identity, and I was able to basically get the derivation in one line. Now we can write it in kind of a, a more convenient form using our polar notation. So recall that I can write any complex number x plus y times j as being the magnitude of that complex number which is nothing more than the square of the square root of the real and the imaginary part times the, the angle, which is nothing more than the arctangent of the imaginary part over the real part. And I can simply move this to the top uh, because everything is in complex notation, so it's all quite nice and easy. And so my final result is as such where the magnitude that sits out front is the amplitude, and this term is the phase. And so that would be just like what you measure in a Bode plot, where this would be the amplitude of the output relative to the input, and that would be the phase between the output, again, relative to the input. So see how easy that is? In one single page, we're able to do the whole analysis that took us several pages of messing things up, remembering our trigonometric identities of sines and cosines. Um, now that I've shown you this shortcut, I'm going to show you even a faster way in the next video.